I would argue, and this this gets me into trouble and people really don't like when I say it, but uh, Amazon's not a monopoly. Grow up. It's not a monopoly. You can buy all the products on Amazon going down to your local Walmart and Target. Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and today we have a special guest. She comes on every quarter. Her name is Leslie Hensel, and she is from Riverbend Consulting. She provides us with um, quarterly updates for Amazon news and compliance and policies, things you need to know to be able to grow your business. So make sure that you are tuning in every quarter when you hear that Leslie's going to be on because this is stuff you really, really need to know. So when it comes to the different policies and plans and news and things like that, you want to make sure that you are in the know because all of this stuff affects you and your business. But before we get to Leslie, I have a very special announcement for all of you friends. Um, Workshops are now open for 2022. I'm going to be in Atlanta teaching a workshop um, for America's Mart in January of 2022. Yes, the um, workshops are back. So I would love for you to be able to come to a workshop. Of course, we do um, the meet and greet party on Friday night, the workshop itself on Saturday, and then the Sunday um, we do a um, trade show walkthrough with um, America's Mart and all those things. So be sure that um, you are paying attention to that. Um, This year actually is probably going to be Thursday, Friday, Saturday instead of uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So make sure that you're paying attention to that. Um, My apologies for um, messing that up. But um, anyway, the 13th through the 15th in January, mommyincome.com slash workshop. I would love to be able to see you and meet you at a workshop in 2022. Very excited. So mommyincome.com slash workshop. Make sure that you get in there. And here's just a little bit about our host today. She is the co-founder and owner of Riverbed Consulting, where she oversees a firm's a, a firm of clients and a, a services for Amazon sellers. She leverages two decades of small business consulting advice on profitability and operations. She's been an Amazon seller for over a decade, and she stops at nothing to help person, uh, personally hundreds of clients to um, comply with Amazon's policies, to get their ASINs and their accounts back up and running, prevent suspension, and also offers like some uh, client management opportunities and Amazon management software. So please, um, Welcome, Leslie Hensel, to the show. Leslie, I'm so glad you're back. Welcome again to the Amazon Files. I know you're always on here, like probably three, four times a year, and we love to see your wonderful face and uh, have you on. So welcome. Thank you so much. It's one of my favorite places to be. We always have so much fun. Oh, fun. Of course we have fun, right? We say that in quotes because um, this stuff, you guys, let's be honest, is not the funnest to talk about, but it's necessary to protect and grow our business. And if we're going to be doing with business with Amazon, there's always changes and updates and policies and compliance and all these sexy words that we have to constantly talk about. So uh, let's just dive right in. Of course, the newest and biggest thing, well, maybe not the biggest, but one of the newest things is Amazon is really um, kind of cracking down on is insurance. So bring us up to date on the newest insurance issues and what your major suggestions are for compliance. So I hope everyone has already uploaded their insurance certificate into their seller central, because if not, you're already asking for trouble. So they, they have always required you to have insurance if you're over a certain amount of sales, which is actually quite small. Everyone should have insurance. You just need it because there are people out there who will complain about things, will say they were hurt by a product, whatever it might be. Whether you think you're at fault or not, you need insurance because insurance essentially gets you a lawyer. So that, all of that being said, um, because the insurance company defends themselves, so they become your lawyer. Um, it, Amazon is saying you have to upload your certificate proving that you have insurance. Now, uh, are they doing anything to people who aren't uploading their certificate? Yes, they are. Um, so we have seen a few clients come in who Amazon has said, hey, hey, where's that insurance certificate uploaded in X number of days? And if you do not, they threaten to shut down your account. Now, I haven't seen them shut down an account yet, um, probably because it's a new SOP. 
Uh, I'm sure that they will get around to it. I would also bet that they're going to get faster and better at reaching out to people who have not uploaded their insurance certificates. I would bet right now that they probably have some kind of an algorithm-based um, computer program that is looking at the insurance certificates and they have people working with that AI to teach it how to know if an insurance certificate is good or not um, because they need a broad range of these for the AI to look at so it can learn. And then over time, it's going to find the ones that are fake or that it's just a random piece of paper someone uploaded and that they can later say, oh, oopsie, that was a mistake or whatever. So just get it done, get your insurance, upload it, and you're not going to have a problem. Awesome. And the minimum requirements are all spelled out there as far as, um, I heard a couple of things. One is that it depends on your level of sales, but um, other things is just like there's this blanket amount and you can choose how much coverage to have, but there's a minimum amount of coverage for liability. Yes. And if you go to an Amazon, so if you go, you really want to go to an insurance provider who understands Amazon. You don't want to just go to a random business insurance provider. Most of them will not talk to you anyway. So you need to find someone who knows Amazon because they already know what all these minimum requirements are because they've been writing policies like crazy to cover this right now. So they're going to make sure that you actually have the correct minimums of coverage. Also, just be prepared. If you sell topicals or supplements, your insurance is going to be expensive. For everyone else, it's very reasonable. Expensive. Um, let's just define that really quickly. So say your average policy is, you know, 800. Hold on. Excuse me there. Um, so say your average policy is about 800 bucks a year or so right. to kind of cover your basic minimums from Amazon. Are you talking double and triple for these types of things or yeah. even more than that? Yeah, I'm talking 2,500 to $4,000. Hmm. Y'all, this is the reason why I don't sell anything in some of these categories that are really high liability because if someone can eat it or put it on their body like topical, right. I'm away from that because I don't want anybody getting sick or getting, you know, dead because they put something on their arm that then, you know, spool up and who knows. So I try now, to stay away from those things. There is something you can do if you have a relationship with the manufacturer. So if you're not just buying product RA or whatever, if you actually are buying directly from a manufacturer and they want you to be selling on Amazon, they want authorized um, sellers on Amazon, you get them to write as part of the contract that if there are any claims against you for product liability, that they will take over those claims, that those will be assigned to them and they will take them over and they indemnify you from those claims as an authorized reseller. So if you're an authorized reseller, actually on just about anything, try and get that in your contract that they will indemnify you from claims. Yeah, you guys might drop. We could literally walk away and have that right now because some of these people, honestly, a lot of them may not even like read that or they think, okay, this is not that big of a deal and they'll just kind of sign it and move along. Um, how many times have we all done that? Not reading terms of service. Um, yeah, well, if you didn't read your Amazon terms of service, good luck with that because <laughs> there's a lot of things you can't do or won't be able to do, but that's great advice. I really appreciate that too because then if you do sell things like topicals or say somebody else's baby product that, you know, baby Baby products are highly recalled for all kinds yes. of different reasons. So if you sell anything that has to do with people under the age of one or even three, maybe um, making sure that you have one of those um, clauses in there that you work with them and that they take full responsibility for the manufacturing. Because if you're a part of the supply chain, you are liable. And hence the reason Amazon wants you to have insurance um, because of these reasons. They don't want to be sued for something. And of course you don't either. So keep passing the buck to the manufacturer. That's amen. Yes. <laughs> I didn't make this product. I just put it on Amazon. So somebody else is liable. Okay. So when it comes to, I've heard this and when it comes to insurance and liability and that sort of thing, bundlers. So of course, you know, here we're all, but most of us are bundlers. So you're taking two or three different products from different manufacturers, putting it in a bundle, but I'm putting my brand on this. Kristen's favorite things provides this gift set. So at that point, the liability then belongs to the brand, which would then be me. Um, and so at that point, is there a way to pass the buck? Because I didn't actually manufacture everything in the box, just the branded box and the, the vessel by which it's shipped. Probably not. That's a really great legal question. I would bet there isn't. 
um, because of the way it's being sold, the way it's being presented on Amazon. And so the person who's suing is going to be basing it on the way that they purchased the product. Fair enough. So if you're bundling and you're using your own bundle brand, which I hope you all are because that's what you've been taught, um, then the liability is more going to be on you. I think in a court of law, there can definitely be some distinguishing between the products, knowing that you oh, didn't yeah. physically manufacture every single thing in that box, including you know bubble wrap and whatever else. But the, the reality is if you're putting your manufactured by or branded by you, you are going to take the heap of the liability in this particular case. Um, so just be aware of that and get enough coverage to, um, you know, foresee something like that if it were to be the case, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And really the minimums that Amazon has are completely reasonable. I would recommend though, that if you're a seller on Amazon, you also personally buy an umbrella insurance policy. Umbrella insurance is one of the best deals in the insurance world. Usually you go to whoever's already writing your homeowner's insurance or your car insurance, and you tell them you want an umbrella policy for one, two, three million dollars, it's not going to cost you that much. It'll be a few hundred bucks a year. And that is just in case um, you ever do have some kind of a product liability suit that goes beyond your business insurance and someone comes after your personal assets. Uh, if you're a sole owner of an LLC and they're able to pierce that and say, because you're the sole owner, the personal liability attaches. An umbrella insurance policy will keep people from taking all of your personal assets away because if you've got one, two, three million dollars there, uh, that's going to help you out. Okay, so having this umbrella policy, you said one to three million dollars just overall to protect your personal assets because some yes. people think just because you have an LLC doesn't mean means that everything's protected, but you just never know. You know, you never can you afford in your personal assets to give away your house and your cars and your cottage up north and you know your dogs and cats because someone will come after you for everything you own um, for these particular reasons. So yeah, we hate insurance. We hate paying for stuff like that until you. You need it until you're like, oh my gosh, I got this policy and now I'm, you know, somewhat protected or whatever. So in the event of such of a nightmare, which on Amazon happens a lot now. And the reason they're doing this is because they're tired of getting sued for every product that it causes a problem on Amazon that they don't manufacture. So fair enough um, for them to be able to pass the buck uh, accordingly. Um, so get your insurance, upload it, do what you have to do, even if it's the minimums. Um, and yeah, it stinks, but it's part of business. Every business needs to have insurance for one reason or another and you're welcome that's just part of it <laughs> <laughs> yes okay. we sadly live in a litigious society and it is the way it is uh, yeah it is crazy okay speaking of that let's talk about legislation right so <laughs> for all of you guys who have been either a living with your head in the sand or b um just having a great summer and not thinking about what's going on at amazon um there has been a new law a new bill introduced to congress um, that talks about the antitrust issues that Amazon is facing and other third party or other big companies that fall within their guidelines. Walmart is one of these. Anyone that has three third party sellers that also sell their own products is my understanding because there's this com competing thing going on. I read the bill in full um, because I wanted to understand exactly what was happening and what could potentially become a law and then Amazon would have to comply. Um, so uh, I'm giving a summary here, and of course you can fill in the gaps for me, but the summary here is like, if this law passes, it would prevent Amazon from competing directly with products uh, side by side with third party products. So um, basically it would help us as sellers in a sense that like Amazon's not gonna take our wonderful product and knock it off and then uh, peddle that to everybody out there in, in, in your place. They will no longer al be allowed to have a competitive advantage, which they already do. So that's good news, but the bad news is that if this law does pass, Amazon could say, well, since I can't compete with my third party sellers anymore, we'll just push them over to a different platform and I'll own Amazon and they'll own this other thing. And then we won't be directly competing, but then our third party sellers aren't going to get the same benefits that we have now. Um, so this is kind of a nightmare and kind of a big deal, but it's also a if, when, how, what. So what are your thoughts on this crazy new bill that's coming down the pipeline? Amazon has already essentially said that they would shut down the third party marketplace if this passes. Um, they are trying to rally sellers to reach out to their congressmen 
about this possibility. Um, reading the bill, it's a lot like reading the legislation proposed in California a couple of years ago regarding uh, suspensions. It's really clear the authors of the bill have no idea what they're talking about. Like they, they do not understand the third party marketplace. They don't understand how it works. Um, I would argue, and this, this gets me into trouble and people really don't like when I say it, but uh, Amazon's not a monopoly. Grow up. It's not a monopoly. You can buy all the products on Amazon going down to your local Walmart and Target. It is not a monopoly. Now, they may have a majority, they have like 40% of market share online, allegedly, by some measures. Other measures say they have 20%. Uh, but online sales in the United States are still like 13 to 17%, depending on how you uh, measure them, of all, of all retail sales. So how can something that's a portion of 13% be a monopoly? It's ridiculous. Now, if you want to talk about antitrust, there are some antitrust violations that I would argue you could prosecute Amazon for right this minute with existing law. You do not need a new bill to pursue Amazon from an antitrust perspective. I think all these Congress people who propose this legislation about a system they do not even understand um, they just want to take a shot at the big boys so they look like Jack the Giant Killer so they can be super cool and they can go out and do press releases. And they have no comprehension of the literally millions of jobs that they could potentially destroy. Not hundreds of thousands, millions of jobs they could destroy by doing this. Also, what's particularly stupid. Sorry, you're getting my real opinion here. No, I want it. I'm all in it because I think we all have different because it's all speculation at this point of what we think or what could happen. And so having multiple perspectives is really important. I love it. I love seeing you getting passionate and heated because I do too. When there's something like this that happens, I'm just like, what do we need to do as sellers? We don't sit right. back and just wonder who, what, when, where, why, and how. We need to be proactive about what's going on here because let's be real. Both of us, our businesses are uh, rise and fall on Amazon, oh, yeah. not just our Amazon on stores, but also here at the Amazon files and mommy income and at Riverbend, that's all you guys are doing. I'm not all you guys are doing, but you know what I mean? That's like the lion's oh, yeah. share of these businesses. So this is really important stuff and we need to be aware and proactive about what we support and don't support in our Congress because it affects your bottom line. I mean, someone told you that if a law passes, it's basically going to eradicate your entire, um, your the entire industry. career. Your entire industry. industry, would you, what would you do about it? You would probably run to Capitol Hill. You would be writing letters to Congress. You would be standing up and advocating for not only yourself, but 3.5 million small business owners would just like disappear. And you can't run to Walmart and go on their third party sellers either because they're part of this bill. Yeah, it's same any thing. company that has third party sellers that also sells their own product and has these um, non -com or com competitive kind of advantages, whatever they are. So whether or not Amazon's a monopoly or not, statistically numbers wise, we can all be real and fair to say that like, if I ask anybody here where they're going to go shop at this point, if I say, what are you looking for? The first place they go is I'm looking on Amazon. Why? Because it's easy and convenient and often a really great price and they'll deliver it. So why not use Amazon? So they are definitely an online kind of um, monopoly, if you will, but retail wise, you can also walk down to Target, Walgreens, any other place that you want to in this universe and buy what you need. So well, yes, yes. And okay, and what is I'm gonna I'm gonna now go off on my particularly stupid because what is particularly stupid, you wanna make Amazon this would make Amazon a monopoly. <laughs> because what Amazon would do is all these third party sellers wouldn't have access to the third party marketplace. They would all be desperate because they have all this money they've invested in product and they have all this staff and mouths to feed. So they would go submit to the Amazon one P beast. They would all sign up to be vendors on Amazon. And then Amazon would have full control over the brands, the pricing, the selection, the delivery time how much they're going to pay the vendors, they would absolutely control everything. As third-party sellers, you have some control over, well, which we could talk about that further because they're trying to take away control over pricing, but they, you have control over your pricing, your selection. You are not beholden to Amazon for what you offer and how. You can go out and develop a new product and put it on Amazon. You don't have to crawl to Amazon and get them to buy it. You're, you're using them as a platform, a conduit to go direct to the consumer 
without having to build your own website and spend God knows what on marketing to try and get people to that website. So by doing this, they would actually create a bigger monster in Amazon instead of doing some magical thing to break it up. They're, they're saying, oh, this will help small business. They would destroy millions of small businesses, hurt the economy. They would hurt availability to products for consumers. Prices could very easily go up instead of down. The, the level of stupidity on this is just mind boggling. And the reason I find it so frustrating is because there is legislation in place right now that all of the issues that they have with Amazon could be addressed under that legislation. There are laws in place about anti-competitive behavior. I can sit here and name 10 things Amazon does that's anti-competitive. Don't get me wrong. I am no defender of Amazon. <laughs> we we right. look at Amazon every single day. And I can tell you stories that would stand your hair on end where they were doing things that I believe were illegal. And right now they have something going on internally that they have employees doing something that is illegal that I am intimately familiar with, but all of that could be dealt with with existing law right now. It does not require new legislation that is going to hurt millions of small business people. It's absurd. And it's not even, like you said, it affects Walmart. It affects any marketplace where there are products sold by the owner of the marketplace. And so it's not like we could all just flee over to Walmart and live a happy life. That's not how this goes. I get very frustrated when people in Washington go into subject matter where they have no clue what they're talking about. Selling on Amazon, selling on marketplaces, it is intricate and detailed. And there are so many different inputs and so many things that people have to do every day. And these guys have no clue what they're talking about. And they think they're going to make things better for small business. Oh, I've got millions of people that would tell them no. <laughs> well, I love and appreciate your perspective. And actually, I've learned some things from this too, because when I first read through this bill, um, I, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when I first read through this bill, at first I was like, yes, like this needs to pass because of this and this. And then the further I got down to reading some of the nitty gritty, I thought, you know what Amazon's going to do? What I would do if I was Amazon after reading this bill, I would say, okay, yeah, third party sellers. I don't need you anymore. I've got enough infrastructure. I've got enough supplies. I got enough things to where I'll just take over retail myself globally. And we, as a company of Amazon will literally then monopolize everything. They don't need my third party because they already have all of our information anyways. So yep. they could literally eradicate us as third party sellers and just take over the entire online retail world. Like you said, creating a bigger monster. And that's the problem that I saw. And I thought, this is a nightmare if this really happens. And so this is why we have to be advocates for our own selves and to have this education, like literally people in, no, no, this is not obviously a political conversation, but we have to have a political conversation because it affects that. Um, well, no matter what side of the fence you're on, this has directly has to do with our businesses, our money, our lives, our everything. And there's people making decisions on our behalf that have no freaking idea what we do every single day and what this right. intricate system is. So I think that that's just one of the things that people need to be aware of is that, yes, we, you know, leading into some of the other things we're going to talk about today. And this is the reason why I think Congress, the people that don't really know what we're doing, but understand that there's bigger problems with billion dollar corporations, is that the problem mainly with Amazon is not necessarily these anti-competitive things, which I know is hurting us. And we could, you know, have a whole other episode about that. Um, but the thing is, is that um, there's no checks and balances balances with Amazon, like in our government, if this branch doesn't do what this branch is supposed to do, there's this checks and balances system that we can go through. With Amazon, if they, like one of the problems, you know, that, that we're going to talk about in a minute is this whole inventory reconciliation issues and how they are losing things. And then they say, okay, you can reconcile the shipment in 30 days and we've lost 512 of your units. And then 30 days passes and they're like, just kidding, 30 more days before you can reconcile this. And pretty soon it's been three months. And then they ask you for invoices to prove that you have sent this inventory in and they won't accept them because they're after the 90 day mark, which they created for themselves. And now they own 512 of your pieces of inventory. 
inventory and there's no recourse. There's no, okay, now I'm going to sue you because you, I have three months of lost sales plus all of this inventory loss that you lost. And I have no way to, you know, you're regulating yourself. And so when you're regulating yourself, there's no accountability. And I think that's what people, third party sellers really want is accountability for Amazon. They don't want us to just go away or for them not to even compete against us. What we want is accountability for when things like this happen and we have nothing that there's nothing we can do about it. Absolutely agreed. And I think Amazon has created some of this problem for itself because they, especially in the last 12 months, they've had a lot of turnover in the high levels of people who believe in the third party program and people who seem to understand that if you want to keep the government out of your business, you have to run your business with integrity and in a way that you are showing that you have accountability. If you don't do that, you are asking for regulation. If you're doing stupid things like telling third party sellers how to price their products, which is price fixing, which is illegal, then you're asking for regulation. If you refuse to return people's funds and drag it out for months and months and say, oh, yeah, we know we owe you that. And then you don't give it to them. You're asking for regulation. And of course, the one you mentioned earlier, which is one of the most egregious, Jeff Bezos got up in front of Congress and said, we have policies internally. We're not supposed to use third party seller data. And then, you know, he's confronted with these audits where it shows that they're using third party seller data and they don't do anything about it. A lot of this is a structural problem at Amazon. People think it's Amazon on purpose being bad guys and that they're out to get you. Now, in a few cases, I think they are out to get you. But a lot of times they have these structural issues because they tried to build their company on this entrepreneurial model where everyone's expected to be entrepreneurial and they're very siloed and you're supposed to have expertise in this area and you're supposed to do these great things. And in doing that, they've lost sight of the big picture of if we treat sellers better, we have better internal systems for reconciliation. We have better internal systems for lost inventory. We have we make sure that we're not using third party data. We actually punish people who do these things. We fire them and make an example of them so that it will stop. If they were more aggressive on that kind of stuff because they aren't so siloed, then we wouldn't even be talking about legislation probably. A lot of people would have gone away, but there will always be politicians out there who they just want to stand on someone's body and say, I killed this giant. <laughs> That's what they want, right? Because they think mm -hmm. it makes them look special or cool. And in this case, this is a bipartisan bill. This is both sides of the idiotic aisle who think they know our business better than we do. So, you know, I would I would argue there need to be some serious come to Jesus, Allah, Muhammad, pick your deity meetings at Amazon about, you know, we need to really look at how we do things and treat people more fairly. I don't think that's ever going to happen. And as long as they have this hubris and, con and continue to mistreat people and think that they can get away with whatever they want to because they're the big guy, they're just asking for bills like this to pass. And then I don't know where that leaves. I don't even know where that leaves them. What's really sad is that I know where it leaves the American public. It's It will stifle innovation in a way that people do not even comprehend. So many new products are built on Amazon. They are Amazon only. It is like an incubator where you can build a brand. You can test things. You can see what works. You can innovate. You can do small batches of things. Manufacture small batches, have specialty products. Go down to your grocery store or your Walmart or your Target. And if you want to buy a bunch of crayons, look and see how many brands there are. There's probably two types of crayons. If you go on Amazon and look for crayons, there's a bunch of brands of crayons, including ones that are made from soy and beeswax and environmentally friendly and ones that have scents and all these things. All oh, that's going to go away. How are you possibly going to sell and market? market that if you don't have access to large marketplaces. I 100% agree. And I really think that that's why it, this is such a scary thing because of the people that are making the decisions and don't understand from day to day that each week and month, uh, me and hundreds of my clients even are innovating new products as far as putting different things out there, bundling products together of people, things that people want already, different brands that maybe people haven't heard of and how many small businesses and households are being upheld by Amazon um, because 
because of the structure that they already have and what that could do for some of these businesses in an instant. And I think they don't even really think about the fact that even a modest seller who is, you know, selling, you know, half a million dollars a year, they're still making a decent living from home yeah. doing what they do. And, and there's tons of reasons why this needs to exist. I mean, because the fact that like, there's just not ways to get the little guy to get their products into stores like, you know, Walmart or Target or anything like that. I mean, what if you did have your smelly crayons that you wanted to put out there and you wanted to be beeswax, soy, organic, whatever they are. And, you know, Target's not, doesn't have the real estate for you. They don't have right. another slot on their shelf to put 50 brands of, of, of crayons. And so, and that's why we have these online marketplaces. And, you know, a lot of people are, you know, I've heard people that don't understand Amazon and conversations I've had recently where people are like, well, why can't you just, I mean, don't you have a Shopify store? Why can't you just sell on your own Shopify store? I'm like, okay, I'm going to give you some data, right? We launched a really amazing product. We have a website, we have a Shopify store, and we also have our product on Amazon. Uh, we launched them both at the very same time, the website and Amazon. And right now we're getting 10 to 15 sales a week on Amazon uh, consistently with both variations. Um, we've sold three total on our website since January. It is now uh, end of September. So you tell me how I can get sales there. Now, if I spent my entire budget on marketing and all this other stuff, I might be able to get a few more sales on my website, but let's be real. When people hear of a product, the first place they go is, oh, I'm going to put it in my Amazon cart or on my wish list to buy or whatever else. They're not thinking about your website. They don't care about your website. They care about the fast, easy, convenient that Amazon offers. And so I think people out there that don't understand e-commerce and don't understand Amazon realize that if you're not there, you're losing already. So how do we get everyone to play fair? Well, you know, a lot of advocates, a lot of people need to stand up and talk about it and, and get their, their, their congressmen and women to understand the impact of what could happen if this comes to the table. Oh, it would be absolutely devastating, not just to people who do what we do, it would be devastating to the economy. Absolutely. Um, and it would create super brands once again. So when we were growing up back in the Stone Age, <laughs> there you would go to the Safeway or the Publix or wherever with your mom and there would be super brands, right? Mm -hmm. There were only so if you wanted canned vegetables back in the day, it was all Del Monte and then store brand. And that was pretty much it. Right. Or, you know, you get your hy vee which is your local or whatever it is. All it would do is put all of the power back into the hands of massive businesses that can afford massive multi-million dollar ad campaigns. It would take all of the power away from startups and small businesses and venture fund backed businesses that develop new products. So there's a brand, I'll give you a perfect example. There's a really great brand of keto cookie on Amazon. And they started on Amazon and then eventually they rolled out to Target. And now they're in a few other places. They never could have taken their keto cookies and just started up their own website, which they do have a website with a Shopify store and they do sell direct. They never could have started that up and gotten enough name recognition on their own website because they didn't have like, what, $25 million to market their keto cookie against Oreo, and because you're not just going against keto cookies, you're going against all cookies. So, you know, Oreo and all the Nabris Nab Nabisco things out there and all the Keebler options. And then there's all of the keto options. There's no way they could have ever done that. Now they have this great business where they're in lots of channels, but it, it never would have happened. And there are a lot of consumers who love that brand. So what are you going to say when none of us ever get to have those brands anymore? We just have to stick with the big companies. You're in Duracell now forever. Yeah. The only battery you ever get to have. There's never going to be a better battery. You just can't. How many clothes do you buy? So many people I know now buy clothes on Amazon that are like no name brands that are $30. Mm -hmm. All that's gone. Yeah. You know, I don't. 
Well, and it, it also kills the structure of Amazon because they thrive on this variety of we are the everything store. We have everything that you need. And there's rarely a time you can go to Amazon and find that super special, I don't know, the one spice that you never have when you're following a Pinterest recipe that's literally like, you need a quarter teaspoon of this thing and that you've like never heard of. <laughs> like, okay, but on Amazon, they have it because somebody out there, one somebody like us, the third party seller, decided that this needs to be on Amazon for whatever reason. So yes, this is a big deal. And this is something oh, yeah. that everyone needs to pay attention to. And if you want to still sell on Amazon and do all these things, you need to be able to, um, you know, fill out that form um, that's on, it's in your Amazon news. So if you go to your seller central dashboard, and then you go to news, if you scroll down a little bit, it was about mid August, or maybe late August, where they put this thing about legislation and whatever. And then there's steps to follow to contact your Congress people to do all these things. Because if you don't, and this bill does go through, um, the chances of us having a third party platform at all is slim to none. Um, I don't see Amazon being really charitable and deciding, eh, we'll stop selling stuff ourselves and we'll just focus on these third party sellers. You really think they're gonna care? Probably not. They've invested too much. They've invested in all of their products as well. They've invested quite a bit. They've invested in building out their 1P network. I mean, would they have to give up all of their 1P? You could make an argument under current legislation that a lot of the 1P they would have to give up as well. Um, not just their own Amazon products, but that there's a lot more that they would have to give up. It, it really makes absolutely no sense. And then us as consumers, you can say goodbye to generic replacement parts for anything in your house, like your vacuum cleaner or your refrigerator. You know, the generic filters, all those are going to go away. You're going to be buying from the brand and paying twice as much. Um, there's just so much that would go away because without platforms like Amazon and Walmart, the, the tiny companies that make all of those cannot exist. Oh, this is such a big deal, you guys. And this is why we are going to, in the show notes of this show, put a link to, um, you might have to be logged into Seller Central in order to access this link because it is directly within Amazon, but we'll put the link in here to be able to see what you guys can do to do that. Um, um, this is from different perspectives and understandings that the bill is complicated, but if you don't understand what we just talked about, you might think it's a great idea and something that you would um, you know, you want it to pass. The reality is, is that Amazon is not going to choose us over their own um, business because why would they? I mean, they're, they're not about us. They're about their bottom line. They're a company in business to do profit and they have millions of, of uh, staff and people and things to support. And they're not going to um, just decide to find it in their heart to um, get rid of all that just for us. Unfortunately, it business doesn't work that way. And um, so if you don't want to be left um, in the dust and figuring out what you're going to do, you definitely need to take some action on these pieces and figure out what's going to be a best for your business. And maybe that is reaching out to your legislation and letting them know, um, you know, feel free to, to quote this and send them this podcast link. I mean, I'm happy to talk to Congress people if I need to, to be like, okay, this is our perspective. Um, and, you know, let's see what we can do to work together um, because these are things that greatly impact not just us, but our global economy. Everybody's relying on Amazon lately, especially with the pandemic and everything else. I mean, that's the number one place people turn to. So, um, all right, we can let that one go now, just knowing that we, we stood on our soapbox for a minute. Right. And we're just going to, oh, okay, let's move on to some other problems. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a trooper. I know that like a lot of times it's all these like negative bad things, but you know, we all have to be able to deal with this in our business in order to what we do it. all day long. Right. It's all it's good. Just, just another day at the office, right? <laughs> okay. So another question someone had, and let's go over this again, is um can you as a brand, you know, as, as we're building our bundle brands and we're trying to let everybody know kind of what we have out there. Um, someone recently asked about including printed material inside of your packaging for your bundle brand. So Kristen's favorite things, I send this beautiful spa gift set to, you know, whoever, and inside of the box, can I have something that says, thank you for your purchase, you know, to leave a review, go here, or here's a QR code you can scan to visit our other products is this allowed and acceptable okay so it depends mm -hmm. like everything at amazon it depends you have to be super careful so 
can you flat out just say leave a review yes you can um can you say here's a qr code to see our other products on amazon yes you can so like if you want to point them to your amazon storefront absolutely you can do that that is totally cool to do it's a great idea love it you cannot direct them off the platform you cannot direct them to your shopify store to your website to your customer service person none of that um, you cannot say if you love the product please give us a review if you don't like the product contact us here that is cherry picking you cannot do that either um, what you really 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 don't want to do is offer any kind of an incentive for a review or say something like oh gosh i had one client amazon went after them because they said <coughs> excuse me they said amazon only offers a 30-day money back guarantee but we don't think that's good enough <laughs> that was their mistake yeah so we will give you a 90-day blah 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 and then gave their website Amazon did not like that at all. What so about the ones that say things like, because I've received in the past, like I just recently, I, I threw it away, but I really shouldn't have. I wanted to show it. I, I should have showed it to you. It basically was like, do you want a $5 Amazon gift card? Scan this QR code to leave a review. And once you do that, you know, enter this code and you get this free $5 gift card. And then another one I said, I found it's this big yellow postcard. I'm like, I feel like I saved this anyway. I'm not waste time on that, but it says, wait warning do not if you have problems with the product please contact us directly do not send this back to amazon contact us we will make it right and so is that acceptable or allowed when it comes to refunds or returns or warranties or any of that nope so amazon doesn't like that because you're directing them away from the platform their assumption is that you are trying to make that customer your customer so they spend all the money so this is kind of relevant to what we were just talking about. They spend all the money building this platform. They spend all the money on the advertising. These are their customers. They're not your customers. They're Amazon's customers. And so they assume that you're directing them away so that then you can say, hey, come directly to my website in the future and buy the product and you know I'll take care of you. So anything where you're directing away to you, they do not like. Now, as far as the offers of things like gift cards, you know, those are all totally out of bounds. And here's why you really, really, really don't want to do it. They've actually started doing checks, bin checks in the warehouse looking for this kind of stuff. They're opening up product. They're looking for the cards. They have not done that before. This is relatively new. I still do not have a full sense of if there's some kind of an investigation going on that then they ask for a bin check from FBA or if FBA has a new initiative where they're just doing these. I'm not sure. But I can tell you that when they find them and you get suspended or you get the 72 hour, give us a POA in 72 hours or we'll shut you down. As part of the POA, you have to remove all that inventory. So if you've sent 2000 units and they all have one of those freaking cards, that has got a $5 gift card thing in them. You're going to have to pay Amazon to send them all back to you or destroy them and write a plan of action convincing them to let you back on the platform. And then, as, as most of y'all already know, uh, platform manipulation is kind of a two strikes, you're out thing. Uh, so if you get caught twice for platform manipulation, your chances of getting reinstated are really low. The best way for you guys to own your own customers in this way is provide a phenomenal product and customer experience and people will look you up and they will find you and they will want to find you other places. If you hear of a product or a brand or something like that you bought on Amazon and you absolutely just love them, support them off of Amazon then if you want to. But like you can't go fishing for that because it's not your playground. It's not your pond. And so uh, unfortunately, Amazon does not want you to be able to do that. You cannot lead them away from Amazon. You don't own your customers. You cannot get their information, any of this stuff. So just don't. 
provide an amazing product, provide an amazing brand, regardless, like with our bundle brands, people are asking, what is allowed on the printed packaging? And this is another question we had um, about packaging that then has your website printed on it. So um, I am the manufacturer of said item. Let me just pull one up here just for fun. Okay, so this is mine. My 15 minute hustle chart, mommy income right here says right on the product.com, right? So if someone wants to order this wonderful thing off of Amazon, which we actually uh, do not have for sale there, it's on the website. But regardless, you get this. And then at this point, you have a great product. It's on the product. So it's not like an extra insert that we're putting in there somewhere or people have their custom packaging that's like, okay, here's just the silly representation. This is a box of Kleenex and this was sold at Costco. So it does not have a barcode individual, but sometimes on here, it'll say like, here, here we go right here. Um, Kleenex box, whatever it says, you know, the dimensions, things like that. Now, sometimes they'll say manufactured in, you know, made in China. And there's some sort of, you know, what do they need to put on the box? Can they put their .com on their custom printed packaging? Yes, as long as it's really clear, it's part of your branding. So like if you have the little section where it says manufactured by manufactured in it has your address usually it has mm -hmm. some kind of a registered address and then if it has a website under that yeah because you're the manufacturer i mean mm -hmm. oreo.com is probably on every package of oreos right right i don't and know that... what i think is with oreos today but yeah. you know but yeah i mean i'm sure i have plenty of products like sitting around right here that it's got the website mm -hmm. as part of their registered address which you usually um, you know, most manufacturing, you should have a registered address on the product. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've got it like splashed across and there's nothing else and there's no brand name and it doesn't look like it's a part of anything, you're kind of asking for trouble. Yeah. So that was just something people were asking is just like, what about if it's printed on your custom packaging? Well, mm -hmm. that could be, you know, that's part of it. Cause if you see products all over, you go to any store, right? excuse me, you go to any store right now and you, you flip over a package and you look for the barcode and you look for all this information, that's the information people are going to see and find. And I would say a majority of those companies have some sort of .com on them to reach out, whether it's customer service, whether it's this or that for questions or inquiries, you know, right. visit this .com. Okay, great. Um, so that's actually printed on your packaging. It's not printed on a sticker that you stick yes. on. It's printed on your packaging, your entire professional packaging. Um, and I feel like that's acceptable, but that's about the only means of acceptable uh, .coms that you can lead people to. Because you can definitely make the argument you would use the exact same packaging if you were selling direct to a retail store. Right. So ask yourself, is this exactly how it would go if I was putting it in my local Walmart? You know, and if it if it's part of that packaging where it makes sense, you're probably fine. But, you know, the, the queries they're looking for where people are saying, don't call Amazon, call us, like you mentioned earlier. Right. That's that's. Okay, well, thanks for clearing that up because I know a lot of people they're just trying so desperately to just get more reviews or get right. more things because the Amazon algorithm favors reviews and favors all these different things. It's like, well, how does somebody new and up and coming get you know this thing else? Another thing I wanted to know is that what is your do you have experience at all with Amazon Vine? and what they i know you're laughing already me too um because people have been asking me about amazon vine and their participation in this sort of thing so this is amazon for you guys that don't know amazon has their own review po uh, program to where you can enter your asins into this review program and then they will give away your product for free for these people in exchange for a fair review and it's amazon verified and so they get a free product and then they get to leave a review and these are top amazon respected reviewers so because it's their system they're allowed to um, it's okay if they do it yes it's okay if they do it it's not okay if you pay people to do it or give away free product in exchange for that but they're allowed to but what hesitated me to enroll said brand or said product in that is that they're actually not obligated to leave a review at all it's just a, you can get a free product. And if you feel like leaving a review, you can, they're strongly requested, you know, strongly advised to leave a review, but they don't have to. So how does that benefit anyone except for the person getting the free products? So they recently increased the price, I believe, of Vine. It might've even doubled it. 
So it's more expensive than it used to be. However, um, most of the people I know have used Vine, the people who actually review the products. Well, that's good to know. I just, I was stopped short of the fact that it said that they weren't obligated. So I could literally give up to 30 products away for free and receive zero reviews. Right, because if they don't do the reviewing, then they fall down, you know, everything's a metric, right? It's Amazon. Mm -hmm. They fall down the list of reviewers. And so they stop getting the products. They stop sending them stuff. So they don't, they won't get any more stuff if they don't do a review. And it's pretty competitive too. Yeah, that's interesting. So have you had yeah. anybody have some good experiences with this said review program? And, it, you I know, have. depending on what, what it's worth and what's it, what it's worth to the people submitting. I mean, I have a really expensive product that is our private label product. And so um, getting the reviews on those and getting, you know, it, it's a harder sell to sell something that's over $100 to people who've never heard of it. Um, so reviews are everything. Um, and I was considering that, but I thought, oh my gosh, like at the cost of goods, like how much does it really cost to have all these reviews done if they get this product and they review it and all that kind of stuff so it seems to be kind of scary um at the same time right and you know part of it is figuring out what kind of impact it's going to have um so a little bit counter to what might seem like common sense if your product is very unique and you don't have as much competition in the category the reviews on vine actually make more sense because they're going to have more of an impact. Whereas if there's already three or four competitors that have thousands of reviews, your two or three Vine reviews aren't really going to get you much. So you need to do something else instead of spending the hundreds of dollars on the Vine reviews plus the hundreds of dollars on the product, right? So if you can say that you're relatively unique, I think it actually makes more sense. Also, there is kind of a follower thing on Amazon with reviews, just like everything else in life, right? Sometimes it takes a few to get other people to do it. If there is a product that has billions of reviews, people stop reviewing it because they think their review doesn't make a difference, right? So if something has 3,500 reviews, people don't even bother unless they're really mad. Mm -hmm. um, but if something has two or three reviews, then they feel like they can make an impact. And so they're more likely to actually give you a review. So sometimes I think if you want to try and see if there's an unlocking effect, if you got a few reviews through Vine and it helped you out, that's smart. But it's one of those things kind of like um, slot machines. You have to set your budget before you start doing it or you'll get tempted and just keep doing it more and more and more. You can't do that. Yeah, I know. That's how I, I'm always scared to fish for reviews because you have to take what you can get and sometimes it's bad. And then you're like, that could really hurt you, especially if you only have three reviews and then you get two bad ones. Now you're now you're really up the creek. Um, your listing will never be shown to anybody anymore. So um, it's just like kind of take the good with the bad and, and hope that if you have a really awesome product, um, then it's one of those things where you want to um, get those reviews and it could help you or it could hurt you. So, all right. So one of the last um, things I want to talk about, I won't hold you up any longer is um, back to seller central seller support um, with all of these issues. We talked earlier about the reconciliation of issues and how they keep kicking the can down the road and things like that. Is there any alternative to these things, alternative ways to get in contact with them, alternative ways to get heard? Because even I was telling you off air, 156 correspondents for the same case um, or the same set of cases over the course of what was it like two weeks or so of this one particular ASIN that's this back and forth and not getting any answers, any responses from any team. Um, is there a way to get to somebody who can really understand our problems? So there are a couple of different things that really depends on what the issue is. If it is a seller performance oriented issue, like an ASIN that's been suspended, um, something that where they've told you they want invoices and they're rejecting the invoices, something along those lines, do try to contact account help. There is a button where you can contact account health in your account health dashboard and under a performance. And, um, you know, it's just like every other department in Amazon. Some of the people in account health are super helpful and some of them are not. Um, but if you call, it's click to call. So you click and you wait and they call you. Uh, a lot of times we've had issues that have been resolved by account health. So, for example, 
um, you've sent the same invoices eight times. Uh, they are valid invoices. You've shown proof of payment. Uh, it all matches everything that's in your seller central. There's no reason they should be rejected. Sometimes account health will tell you, oh, we're rejecting this because, because they'll see the notes and they'll tell you. Or they'll say, I don't see a reason for this. Let me resubmit. And I'm, all of a sudden it's magically fixed because they'll kind of escalate it internally. So that can be helpful. Um, I think we talked before about the captive team. The captive team is really great for FBA related issues, um, especially things around like reimbursements where you're just getting messed around over and over again. Unfortunately, on that moving the date out thing, that's all automated right now. So there's no magic to fix that. Um, but on other uh, issues with like stranded inventory where they need to refresh a listing and no one is paying attention or, um, you know, you've submitted the invoices 10 times on the FBA and they're still not reimbursing it. The captive team is pretty useful on those things. Also, uh, earlier you'd mentioned, you know, does Jeff work anymore because Jeff isn't there? Um, so this is a lot of people for years have used the Jeff at Amazon.com email address. Um, and so Jeff would essentially take a handful of these emails each day and look at them. And then the rest would be looked at by a team of people. And there's two teams. There's one on the customer side and there's one on the seller side. Um, so I have good news that yes, that email address is being answered and it is actually being answered by executive seller relations. And we're actually getting some pretty rapid answers right now uh, from the executive seller relations team through the Jeff at Amazon email. I don't think they're going to turn that off anytime soon because I think it would be bad look. I think if he had died in a fiery crash in the Blue Origin spaceship, they would still have that email address on because it would be a bad look to turn it off. Um, so right now, sellers, that is still a great way to get someone to pay attention. In fact, it might even be better than it was before because it's not being held up in this dual queue. It's going straight to executive seller relations. Awesome. That's great to know. <clears throat> as far as the, um, um, well, the reconciliation and things like that, the um, canned email responses, um, the, the responses with that, I'm going to do the Jeff at Amazon at this point, because after 156 correspondence and no real answer, they're asking me to do something that's actually impossible, which is re, re and actually against their policy. They're like, you cannot reach out to another seller, a competitive seller or somebody else and ask for these things to be done. That's actually against their terms of service, yet they're telling me to do so um, in order to resolve a problem that I know they can fix in a minute. Um, and so um, after all these back and forths and a lot of people have been struggling with these types of things, um, how to contact them. Now let's talk about the captives um, for just one second because I've had two clients this like last week alone that they're, uh, they were on the phone with seller support and they asked for someone in the captive team and they, were, they told them, no, there is no captive team. There's nobody else. There isn't a manager. I'm basically the only person you can talk to. There isn't a captive you can speak to. They're going to give you the same answer I'm giving you. And so how do we respond to that? Because that's been happening lately as well. Yeah, there is a captive team. They have been told to do anything that they can to not escalate issues um, because they're understaffed and they're undertrained. So I've actually, this, this is another one of those things that it's going to sound totally contrary to what everyone has ever told you because people always tell you, get on the phone with them. You're going to have better results than if you try emailing in the cases. The last few times I've had problems with this, I've actually emailed back. So I always state, number one, you told me to do this. Number two, I have already done that three times. Number three, I did it again and it still didn't work. Number four, I need this escalated to the captive team. And then they will come back to you again and say the same thing again. And then you say, I need this. Ask you respond and say, clearly, you do not understand. The problem i need this escalated to the captive team and after asking for captive two to three times by email i actually get it sent to the captive team but you have to be polite you can't start yelling even an email they can tell if you're yelling in the <laughs> email but what's really important is to say i have this is a problem i have already done a b c d e x y and z you told me to do those things. Again, I've already done them. Please escalate to the captive team because I need more help. Um, so it's super important that you show, according to their escalation protocol, 
that you've already done all the things because they always assume it's user error. Yeah. And you know what? Let's be real. I bet a lot of it is user error because oh, sure people does. just don't know what to, to do. And I understand that as well. Um, being in customer service ourselves and understanding all this, yeah, there's a lot of user error that can go on. Um, but when people have real problems and need real help, um, this is this is the kind of language that we need to use. So you guys go back, listen to that, write that stuff down, um, escalating it. And, and yeah, I, I tried both email and phone and all the stuff. And even on the phone, they said, okay, well, I can't hand, handle your questions, but I'm going to email the proper team. And then, you know, after I get off the phone 15 minutes later, I get this email that's exactly the same as the one I got before, almost like I wasn't on the phone with them for an hour. Um, right. And it's really, really frustrating. And these are things that are sending people off of Amazon or Reddit going, this is just not worth it. And, you know, they end up going and working at Starbucks or something. I mean, I'm not against that. I'm just saying that, like, don't give up so soon. But at the same time, we need to be able to be proactive about these things. Maybe it's hiring a VA to be able to handle just your cases like this to keep them open and keep them going, create some templates and keep moving forward with it. Because to be real, like this is part of what we're doing in business is putting out fires all the time of like all the different stuff that Amazon's not complying in their own policies. Um, so just hang in there because they are understaffed as well. And so that's why we're getting way more canned emails than we were before, um, if that's even a possibility. Um, but it's true. Um, and hanging in there as well. And um, Leslie, I thank you so much for being here. I, I'm sorry, you said, you said you have one more thing. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I think some of the fr most frustrating words in the English language are, I have forwarded your request to the concerned team. If I say, you know, you're like, if I see that one more time, yes, certain team. So, yeah, I know. Yeah. And they're and so vague about, especially with invoices or even people sending the COIs of insurance and whatever else. It's like, this is rejected, but then they don't tell you why. It's like, right. we're supposed to figure out this crazy Let's mystery. Know. Yeah. It's just like, okay, let's see how long you know, it's, it's almost like they're waiting for us to just give up and quit because you know, all of this stuff in, and, and I, I have no patience or grace. It seems for Amazon at this point, not because they're customer service, but because they don't train them well enough. And then they turn over so fast because they're not meeting their quotas and blah, blah, blah. It's like, ah, this is obviously a leadership problem. Um, but you know, things like that, are, we just have to deal with what we have to deal with. So you have given us tons of things, not only to take action on, but also to be aware of, and it's so invaluable. Tell everybody what you do at Riverbend, what your team does and how they can get connected. I guys, I am a personal customer of Riverbend. They handle my account management and those things and reimbursements and all that good stuff. And I fully and um, hundred percent trust them and their integrity and and all of the great things they have. And so um, that is why you see Leslie's wonderful face on here every every few months. And um, so tell us a little bit more about Riverbend and how people can get started with you guys. Absolutely. So Riverbend is just now four years old and our bread and butter is account suspensions and ASIN reinstatements as well. So when you get just a product knocked off, we can help with that. Uh, we have some people who are on a monthly plan if you're a larger seller and these things happen to you a lot uh, that we will just automatically monitor your account and take care of ASINs that go down. We also can help with account management in terms of like customer service messages, reimbursements, all that good stuff. And then we have some exciting new things, Kristen. So Ooh. we help people get editorial recommendations, which is that magic editorial recommendations banner uh, across the, across one of the pages of search that you can look for. We can help get in those. We do the best product videos for Amazon in the marketplace. I'm telling you, they're just freaking amazing. And then an exciting thing for private label people is that we have Project Retail where we, we will help you get your products that are Amazon only into retail stores. Um, so you Ooh, can find baby. out. <laughs> yeah, you can find out more about any of these at Riverbend.com, and then you can also head on over to LinkedIn and send me a connection request. Um, I post Amazon specific content every weekday. Yes, her LinkedIn, that LinkedIn is fantastic and always stuff that's in the know, you guys, even if you're not on LinkedIn, um, which why, because there's so much good stuff there that's like not as, 
I don't know. I like LinkedIn better than some other social channels. I don't even think of it as social, even though it is. Um, right. But I do love uh, LinkedIn because it's really just some informative, good stuff. There's lots of articles. Leslie's always bringing the truth because she doesn't care about if people like her or not. She cares about the truth. She cares about the integrity of business and cares about those types of things. So it's not a popularity contest. It's a let's get stuff done and let's get it done in the good and right way so that we all can continue living our best lives. <laughs> so um, then. Kristen, you're on fire today. <laughs> then great. Well, that's just how I see it. That's just my what I see and, and some of these things because really, you know, especially with these types of things, like people don't have to like me. They don't have to like what I have to say. It's just the truth. You know, take it or leave it. I'm not sugarcoating and I align with people that are, are very similar in that way. And um just whether what it's, a lot of the things we talk about are unpopular, you know, it's just like not something that we want to, you know, discuss. We want to talk about product launches and this and that. Yeah, that's great. But let's talk about compliance and your bottom line and things that are affecting your money because that's why you're in business, right? Because we're trying to make profit. And the more and more these companies try to get in our pockets, the more we need to, you know, make sure that we're doing all the right things to protect ourselves. So this is why all these things are necessary. So you guys, riverbendconsulting.com is the place to go. I fully and highly recommend them and their team. Um, I get these wonderful emails from them every month about all the reimbursements they found for my account and um, all that happy stuff. So make sure that if that's something you need or want to need that um, Leslie is here for you. Everything will be in the show notes for you as well. And we will see you, Leslie, um, again next quarter to be able to talk about all the new updates then. So thank you so much for coming again. It's been a pleasure and thank you for all you do. Thank you so much, Kristen. It was fun as always. <laughs> Guys, same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files. Tune in and we'll be talking about other good fun topics then too as well. We'll see you then.